I would like to welcome Professor Ian Kutte from Information Governance. He's the Senior Director for Information Governance, who will lead this discussion with a presentation on the current indicators. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Noreka. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm going to start off just by showing a bit what we have on the scorecard for the university. So this is directly opposite to what uh, the previous speaker said, is uh, we love single numbers. <laughs> so we've developed a composite index, and it produces a single number for the university. But I must emphasize right away that I do agree that metrics are not the major focus of uh, university. I think we should not spend too much time on collecting data for metrics. For metrics. I think if we can automate the collection of data, that would be the right way to go. Um, it's necessary to have metrics because we should know where we're going, but it shouldn't be overemphasized. But let me start off by explaining just a little bit about the scorecard of the university. For those of you who have not uh, seen it, um, this is available on the Power BI cloud service of the university. Uh, this particular uh, application was developed by Rene Robertson over there, who will take over from me shortly as part of uh, the work in the division. And the teamwork over here, as I have team members over here that also help us with the data, with all the putting together of all the details for LM Ace. Uh, and next team, Andre Dorfling, who are members of, uh, of my team. Valalami is director of the Center for Business Intelligence. So to start off with, let's just review quickly the strategic framework. So the scorecard was set up to um, measure the strategic teams, themes of the university. So we have six of them. But for theme uh, number four, we are still after a few years trying to finalize the indicators. We've made some progress with them, and I hope that you know by next year we'll have something for them. But let me just remind you of the terms that we use. So on the left-hand side, we see the SU's core strategic themes. There are five of them. One is a thriving Stellenbosch University. Number two, transformative. I uh, can't see the full text there. And then number five is research for impact. So this just this displays all of the different uh, themes that we have. And the next level is um, the uh, indicators and measures. Let me go to this. If you look at research for impact, then we have three institutional objectives for research uh, for impact. One, um, sorry. One is the average number of SUDHE publications, doctoral candidates, and master's graduates. So in terms of what Johan said earlier, uh, if we measure these things, this is the type of behavior that we will drive. And these indicators that we decided upon collectively in the past were actually set up to also show us what we earn from DHET. So um, the measures that we have at the moment for research for impact reflect the kind of things that we are measured for also by higher education. So let me go back to research for impact. So the uh, strategic theme has uh, two components, as we said already, support research staff and invest in capacity development, and the other one is increase research impact. So on the left-hand side, the left-hand panel shows us the percentage of academic staff members with a doctorate compared to all academic staff members. So the idea of this indicator was to drive the behavior that we should have academics, or academics should have a doctoral degree. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, with a doctoral degree, you can supervise doctoral students. And uh, this is, I think, quite a common indicator uh, in the world for a staff component for uh, driving research. And the second one that is, uh, I think, quite particular to Stellenbosch University is the percentage of postdoctoral research fellows to all academic staff members. So the idea here was that um, postdocs uh, contribute to our research, and if we have more postdocs, they can 
assist us more with research outputs. And while I mention outputs, what we are measuring, of course, are outputs, not outcomes. And outcomes are related to impact. This is one of the big discussions we've had in the past as well, is how do we really measure impact? And even, so outputs are the actual products of what the university produces. The outcomes are outside the organization. They are not easily measurable. They are long-term results that occur, for instance, because of certain research uh, publications or policies that we've helped produce or things like that. And on the right-hand panel, the increased research impact has three different objectives. The one at the top is the average number of SUDHET accredited publication units. And these publication units we normalize by using the senior lecturer, lecturer equivalent uh, staff unit. So what we do with senior lecturer equivalent is we, uh, for each department or for each unit in the university, we normalize the staff FTE numbers, full-time equivalent numbers, to the number of senior lecturers that are actually in that particular unit. So even across the university or in a department or in a faculty. And this gives us a denominator that we can use for comparison across the university. So the manpower in a particular unit is measured in terms of its number of senior lecturers or senior lecturer equivalents. So this measure is also not um, derived from the, from the salaries of the senior lecturers, but according to the, um, um, the, the uh, BRLs. BR, the BRLs uh, what is it? Is, is that basic. basic basic remuneration basic. levels. Right. Sorry, I was I was with the Afrikaans. Basis of Sorry. So the relative percentage of a lecturer is just its proportion. Of, its, uh, of, the, of the top salary, of the salary bracket, compared to a senior lecturer. And that gives you a fractional contribution to uh, staff members. OK, so we can see that the, the targets have been set for this particular one to 1 1.75. Um, and the, the blue line shows the, the data values. I didn't say that before, but I think it's quite obvious for all the researchers in the room. And then on the, on the panel just below uh, this, the average number of doctoral graduates per year, again, uh, per FTE, SLE, C1 staff member, in other words, academic staff members only. C1 appointments are the academic appointments. And there we can see the data compared to the targets. And then on the right-hand side, the master's graduates. So this, in essence, uh, uh, is the data that university collects for its scorecard. Johan mentioned many other metrics that we, we could consider. We don't have bibliometric information in here. But what Rene will show shortly uh, is a lot of other data that we have in yet another Power BI application. So we use these measures uh, in the model that we have to compute a certain effectiveness or to contribute to a certain score. I'll say something about that uh, briefly. So um, when, we calculate, when we calculate these scores, um, the scores are calculated relative to the target that we have. So all of these, all of these um, indicators are, um, so, so, so most of the indicators, but those with indicators are simply the calculation that I show on the screen over here. In other words, um, if you're on the left-hand side, you have a percentage of academic staff members with a doctorate to all, and you scored 61.8% of the staff members, but the target is 75, then you just work out the relative proportion of that 68 to the 75, which gives you something that we call effectiveness. So you are 82.4% effective in reaching the target. And this effectiveness score is then calculated in a weighted average for every one of these institutional objectives and summed together to produce an, a composite index uh, in the end. Sorry, let me just go to the right one. So this shows you a calculation for research for impact as the weighted average of the contributions of each of the elements. 
and uh, uh, each of the branches of this of this tree contributes a certain percentage. Those percentages we can set, but we have set them all to be exactly equal. And the reason for that is it takes a time for an institution to develop the use of tools like this. So this tool has been in existence for uh, two, three years. And what we see is it takes a time to get familiar with it. So once we get more familiar, to, familiar with it, one can adjust these percentages to put more focus on other elements that you think are more important. But for the time being, they're all weighted equally, 50% or 33% for each of the branches. But that can be changed later on, depending on the research directions that you want to take. This is also, um, in a way, uh, against the typical grain that says one should have <coughs> seven plus or minus two um, indicators that you focus on. This comes from an article long, long, long ago that says that most people tend to focus on seven plus or minus two things uh, in, when they concentrate. But in, in overall, if you, if you count the number of measures and indicators that we have, um, it's the final number of, the, of uh, indicators are about, I think, 42, 44. But the total number of values that you have to watch is 100. But the reason why one can manage this, this is the argument, is that because you break them down into hierarchical levels, you are just managing about seven plus or minus two at each level and at each branch. This does not prohibit us from adding more or reducing them. And I think this is one of the questions that we should probably talk about is the usefulness of a tool like this. So we've got the concepts worked out. We know how I can put these composite indexes together. Indices, we can get a single number for the university. This is what's published in the annual report. But then when it comes to the use of a tool like this, um, it's up to you to decide you know, is this the kind of thing that we would like to have? How should we change it? And how we, do we use it to drive behavior? It's well known that those things that you measure drive the behavior of the people that are measured. And since this community represents the community that is measured by research, it's, I think, time to reflect on are we exactly right with these things. So this was the design of the indicators at the beginning of the strategic framework 2019. We are about in the middle of the framework now. We have three years left. Uh, the framework runs until 2024. So it also makes sense to start reflecting on the way forward. Unless you have questions, I'm going to stop here and pass over. So this is the strategic themes that we have. There is a next level where each of these indicators or those that are that are possible, we break down to a faculty level, which I'll ask Renee to demonstrate. And then we'll also demonstrate uh, just the research data that we've collected so far, which is a Power BI tool that the deans and department managers can use. Renee? Uh, ladies and gentlemen. So um, like Professor explained, uh, we work out the effectiveness and on the left hand side, my apologies, on the left hand side you can see the university, the six core strategic themes except for core strategic theme four. It's very hard to see. Um, I'm going to try. Okay, so I'll focus on one at a time. So uh, on the left-hand side, this is for the university. Uh, is this better? I'm just asking. OK. Uh, so we have the five core strategic themes, so I'll accept core strategic theme four. And we have it across uh, several years, from 2018 to uh, 2021, which is the latest data. Uh, so we can see the movement across years. And then on the right-hand side, what you can also do is you can have a look at a specific faculty. So if I just scroll up, you can select the different faculties. I've selected medicine and health sciences, but any faculty that you would like to focus on, and you can then view it um, against the university. 
but you can also then drill down on the left hand side uh, on the core strategic themes and select for example research for impact and then on this option here below you can then drill down to the strategic management indicators and have a look at those in specific across years. So you can drill down into a lot more detail, but this is what I wanted to show if you don't have any other questions for the um, scorecard. So now I'd like to show you the data that we collect from, um, uh, we receive it from the Division of Research Development. This is for the faculty research data and we just add uh, more data to this. But what you can find in this Power BI application is research publication units as well as the financial data behind it, postdoctoral research fellows. Uh, we also have Consolidocs here and we have uh, creative outputs in our F rated researchers, information, international funding, the different other kinds of funding, the Tuka funding, HP and MJ, Tom a bursary the national grants, and we have several pages and several graphs on all of this information. Um, applications for ethical approval, and then a few stats on masters and doctoral uh, uh, degrees awarded at Stellenbosch University, as well as the academic staff with doctoral and, re and master's degrees. So I'm not going to take you through all the pages. There are 93 pages in this Power BI application, so it depends on the question that you would like to answer, but just to give you Pardon? A question. Oh, a question. Oh, where's the... No, please ask me any time. I might forget, that's why. Yes, <laughs> it's better to stop me and then we can handle it immediately. Sorry. No, thank you, Prof. Thank you so much. I just wanted to check, so the slide which you just, before you came to this slide, you know, where you had those... Um, the you were calling, calling them uh, management indicators, yeah. Oh, it's this one, the scorecard with the strategic the management yes. yes. So, on this one, I, I just want to check the indicators we have here. Are those the We publish this in the annual report for the university. It's exactly the way they are. Yes, the, exactly the way they are. Those are collected and they can be broken down to pay faculty. Yes, per faculty, okay. yeah. So that's fine. Then if you go to your next slide, where you were just when I interrupted. Here. Yes. yes. Um, so if we want under eight, we put grants. Okay, so you are looking at national grants. But, but I think one of the indicators we're being asked to include there is um, the number of calls, you know, the calls in terms of grants, the number of grants that we get, mm -hmm. that we send out to the university community and then the number of applications that we actually send out. And then we also want to know the success rate for those that we actually submit that indicator. Is it one of the indicators that we have? Uh, not in this Power BI application. But it can be added. But it, Marake, um. so it can be added, right? Okay, thank you. Sorry. I can only say that that, that, will be, that data will come from our research uh, grants management office. That's Marianne's office. So, what we're currently doing, we have, we've had that data normally in Excel spreadsheet format and Maraika would collect it also for the information facts so that's sent to every department and then you could pull it up to every faculty level. Um, but what we are working on now to make that a bit easier is a, a database in Madeleine's Grants Management Office to really capture all of that information in one place to be able to draw out applications, funding applied for, funding successfully obtained, etc. It's not an easy job because mm -hmm. there are sometimes and there are very often um, online databases that are used for certain NIH applications go on, on their own online database or online application system. Um, EU would go on theirs, but we try to collect that data and aggregate it and put it together in a in a database to be able to report on that, and then we also provide that data at departmental level and at faculty level through the information units. So, so, so but, but basically, thank you for that. So, so but what you're saying is that if we need a new indicator, we can add it. Yes. It's, it's an agile system, it's it, not fixed. Absolutely, Prof. 
Yeah, so we can add any um, information here or data that is required and we can receive it then from the DRD. Okay. So we can just make a note of that. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to take you through a couple of pages to give you a feel of the kind of uh, visualizations and the data that we have here. So on this page, we can view the preliminary um, data that's not yet approved by DIET, but will be soon, uh, so that we can see um, the pub research publication units. We can break it down to the different faculties, and you can also see it by research type on the right-hand side. You can then also just have a look on, uh, so pardon, before we go to that, that, the next one is the approved um, research publication units, and here we also then add financial data. So the yellow line, that represents the research publication units, and the blue columns, that is our is, um, special support scheme, that's the financial data that is then uh, provided to the different faculties. On the right hand side, again, you can have break it down to, into the different research types and you can then also filter down to specific departments if you want to have a look at a specific faculty. Here I've selected agri-sciences, for example, we can see the different departments in agri-sciences and you can also then filter according to research types. So depending on what you would like to answer or view, you can actually drill down in many different ways. We can also see this is a different visualization where you can see movement across different years from 28, 2015 to 2022. On the left hand side is faculties and on the right hand side you can see the departments. You also have your average line and your median line just to see where a faculty falls um, against the rest of the university. Then uh, this is another visualization where we can see uh, how the publication units are put together, the different types of uh, research types, and there's a difference between the field of study and the different faculties. And then you can also see across years, um, the movement across years, the changes, and a faculty can also have a look across years how the research publications um, changed, improved, or you can drill down for a specific faculty for the departments and you can view the data across the different years. So that is the research publication units. I just quickly would like to show you, we also have now creative outputs. So when we have a look at music and visual arts, that's also important to, uh, important to have a look at. And the different information about creative outputs, you will find financial data um, broken down into different faculties, departments, and even more data. So there are a couple of pages about that. Then I would like to show you, we also have postdoctoral research fellows. I'm not going to show you all the pages, except if there's something in specific that you would like to have a look at, but you can break it down to faculty level, you can break it down to department level. We also have Consolidoc information here, Consolidoc um, according to race, according to gender, faculty, department, NRF ratings uh, for Stellenbosch University as well as national NRF ratings. So all the lists that I showed you in the beginning. And then I would just like to end off with the masters and PhD um, data that we just have here because it's important when we have a look at research data. PhD is a master's doctoral, um, doctorals awarded according to different faculties. You can break it down to departments and you can always also see uh, the race and the gender if that is something that you would like to have a look at. And you can do this for the um, C1 staff, the academic staff with masters in specific or PhD um, degrees, again, race, gender, all the kinds of information, faculty, department. So a lot of information in this application that you can go and view. And this is also in the cloud and you can get access to this if um, you would like to use this. Yes, uh, one hand. It should be accessible by everyone. I think that everyone should have access to What's happening with the data? I just wanted yeah. to know how how live how updated is it? Uh, are we able to get live data like for now? So, you know, right now, uh, um, you know, what's happening in terms of 
um, as students are graduating, do we wait for the audit period or is it loaded as things are happening? Is it real time data? Uh, so this is not real-time data, but as is the graduation finish, um, I refresh the data and I update it. The rest of the uh, research publication units, as soon as uh, Dalian has it, uh, she sends it to me. I update the data, so that is more annually. Uh, also, the international funding. Yes. Yeah, um, Astrid, and I just want to ask about the um, I see that arts and humanities are featured quite strong in the so what does that mean? Um, there seems to be an associated amount of money. Does that mean that those departments are getting... Does that money filter down into those departments? Or does that relate to what we heard earlier in relation to how um, there are a lot of local um, arts and humanities journals and the, and the publication units are coming from there? I just wanted to ask a bit about that. Um, thank you. That's a very inter interesting question. So I might I ask the Lian to assist me here because this data I receive from if if Dalian is here, um, Prof. Kluter, would you like to assist? So, uh, perhaps I can answer just partly in in the meantime. Uh, of course, the publication units uh, are those approved by the HET. So the publication units eventually boil down to subsidy that we receive at the university, and that is distributed back to the departments uh, that earn the subsidy. So for each of those units, they do actually earn up subsidy. But, but while I'm here, I'd just like to add that the data that we are displaying here all come from uh, Darina's uh, division. The value that we add to that data is just the fact that you can see it in an interactive uh, form and you can drill down and match. If you have to publish that on paper form, you're going to produce hundreds of pages for each of those graphs. Um, whereas with this with this form, uh, you can drill down and look at the data that you would like per year, per each of those uh, uh, slices that we have, and that makes it much more comfortable to look at a particular piece of data that you that you would like to to have. In the past. Uh, you'll remember that we had uh, reports and so on. So uh, the purpose of this is to give you an interactive method to access the data but are still based on the either audited data or the data that we eventually get back from, from DHET as well. So what Renee showed earlier was preliminary data. The preliminary data are those elements that we receive internally in the university before they go to DHE and are returned to us as approved or audited. Um, just to answer your question in terms of the funding for the publication units, um, it depends on, well, it's got to do with the way subsidy units are calculated. So, so for instance, it's a journal article. According to the DHET policy, you get one unit for each journal article. But the units are always divided equally within the number of authors. And typically within the within the social sciences you have less authors per paper. Um, so therefore your subsidy units in those fields would be higher, you know, if you just look at, at the very simple calculator, the way the subsidy units are calculated. So it's not the number of publications as such, um, because the subsidy is directly linked to the Thank you. Um, do you think this, maybe the, if I understood the question correctly, it was about the S fund that flows to the department. So yes. maybe just a quick explanation of that. So at Stonewash, I mean, you might know that can you, almost each university has a different approach to this. Um, so at Stellenbosch, there is, there was a decision taken, and I think this has been in place for a large number of years, even before my time, which is now about more than a decade ago, um, that we would let, uh, we would um, award individual authors um, in departments with more or less 10 percent of the subsidy income of that particular year for the full unit. So that's currently what flows through subcommittees A, B, and C. Um, is a small award that goes into the research account of a department, uh, but then there's a regulation that governs the use of that S, we call it the SOS fund, 
and that the environmental chair would be responsible for ensuring access for the authors um, to that funding for needs they might have. Um, for example, if they need to buy a book or they need to, to want to add to a conference attendance or something like that. So it's a, it's a slow build up. It could be if you save a little bit of that together that you could have saved enough for, to, to go to an international conference. It's not a big amount. But it's also important what Ian points out is that that um, subsidy coming in actually forms part of the overall budget of the university. So salaries that are paid within faculties, etc., are also paid from that subsidy. But then we've got this small S fund that flows to individual authors via the departments. Um, and yeah, I guess that's all I can say. It go comes through subcommittee A, B, and C. And if you need info on that, then we can. So, Dani, uh, I just asked Renee to show the contents again. Uh, so, the data that uh, the Reno's division provides uh, have been put together here. If there are other things that you'd like to do I mean, from the database that you mentioned, if we don't have that data, one can, I suppose, quite easily draw it into um, this presentation here. And uh, if you tell us how you would like to compare data, it would probably not be difficult to set up pages that you know compare data from different sources, perhaps per department or per faculty. I'm not sure exactly what you would like to do. But obviously, what you are saying is that uh, given the state of funding in South Africa, one should really concentrate on uh, sources uh, outside, maybe, or that are not as susceptible to uh, to government policies or whatever they do with the money. Uh, so if those are requirements that you think we should put in here, uh, please let us know. We'll, we'll do it as far as we can, together with Tarina, to see what is available, what's possible. Just a question around the doctoral, um, doctoral degrees, master's degrees, or as far as I know, the data is self-reported, so if you don't fill it in on Oracle, that's not captured, is it? I've, I've, never, uh, I've never heard that anyone's gone and actually done an audit of, of the qualifications of staff, is or, or am I incorrect? Um, so, Nikki, if you are referring to qualifications of staff, there was a dip in October 2017 when HR's database somehow got lost and our staff qualifications were incorrect. But since then, that has been restored. If you're talking about staff qualifications, doctoral qualifications for staff. Okay. But, the, but the student graduations are picked up from the graduation records. So yeah, master's graduate. Staff. So, so, so the last, your last um, line yeah. there, yes. staff with doctorates. Yes. That is, as far as I know, self-reported. You actually have to go 
an oracle and put in that you've got a PhD or a UFO or whatever. No one, no one actually goes out and, 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 and audits that and, and looks at all the qualifications of our staff. I think that is a process that should run within HR. If you are appointed at the university, then um, the HR should check the validity of your qualification and make sure it's entered correctly. We get the data from the HR database. But also, <clears throat> the other things, if, if people uh, acquire PhDs, there is a, a batch job, if I have it correctly, that runs and updates the staff qualifications from the graduation. Uh, data that we receive. I see Dorothy's hand at the back. Um, thank you. I just want to uh, reiterate and confirm that, um, Ian, it's a very big problem. I've just come out of an exercise of trying to identify which of our um, one staff members do not hold a PhD um, and in order to be able to distribute a, um, a particular call to them. And um, yeah, it's, 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 you, you have to really derive it from people's title and that's not always accurate because you've got medical doctors who are a doctor and they are not PhD holders. So yeah, it's, it's really a problem um, with the quality of that kind of information and it extends to many other things as well about our staff, even about um, our students. So it's not really uh, helpful in trying to convey information that's useful to them to do other things. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dorothy. In fact, <coughs> uh, within, the, within my division, we've talked about data quality for a long time and how to actually ensure data quality, because you're right, if, uh, if we present the wrong data, you're going to get a completely skewed picture. But uh, Valellum uh, in front here actually ran a project a while ago with HR trying to fix up all the HR qualifications. Uh, so this is something that uh, I think we should also escalate to, to a higher level to make sure that we have audits and we have the correct data on the, on the HR system. And yeah, maybe it's also about data stewardship. Mm. In terms of of what. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so when it comes to data management, um, my colleague Geraldo isn't here today, but um, we are starting processes where we look at um, data curatorship across the institution. So being a steward of data, who is responsible for data, and it's something that uh, the regulation will determine uh, ownership of data records and who has to make sure it is it is updated. So that is really something that the institution should grow into to make sure we have the correct data. But I do I do ask that if you if you pick up anything that is incorrect, let us know. We are not always the owners of the data. Uh, we report what we receive. But it is important to, to look at the quality of data and it's something that uh, that, that we should we'll pay attention to immediately if we if we know of anything that is wrong. We we pick the the staff qualifications up by accident that somehow in the HR system uh, the uh, the qualifications disappeared at one point or was overwritten. It's available. In fact, Andre Dorflin, right next to you, has uh, set up a Power BI with staff profiles. That's available. Uh, access to these Power BIs that you can f are, is uh, from our website. 
So if you want to know the list of everything, there's a PDF that tells you all the different kinds of information that you can get. And these things are also public. Some things are publicly accessible. You can just click on the website and go to the Power BI, or otherwise you have to be behind single behind the the uh, firewall behind single sign-on, and then you get access to a lot of data from the website. That's what we try to do with a PDF on the website to tell you what is available, who you can contact if you have uh, problems, and so on. So all of that is a single entry point through the division's website.